Thank you, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Warren Truss. The Minister is very happy to take questions. So who'd like to get the ball rolling this morning and uh, come down to a microphone? There are two in each aisle. If you could say who you are and where you're from, that would be terrific. The house lights have come up so we can see uh, people in the aisles now. Uh, Minister, I might get the ball rolling myself. You were talking about a very impressive list of regional development projects. They are very substantial numbers. And at the end, you were emphasising the need for increased productivity to uh, maintain or even lift Australian living standards. These projects are, uh, are impressive, but they are in regional Australia. How do you sell that message and garner the support of the majority of voters who live in the cities? Well, the list also, I might add, includes significant projects in the capital cities. Uh, they are on the national network. Uh, because the Commonwealth has a particular responsibility for supporting financially and uh, with, uh, with, with all of our endeavours, uh, the, the road and rail network which, which is under the, the, the is a, which is a part of that national system. So our major projects in the city are, are about moving freight uh, readily, more readily in and out, uh, but also our projects in, uh, they link with our projects in regional communities. Uh, we recognise that most of our, our wealth as a nation, our resources are produced outside the capital cities. And so those areas need major upgrades in their critical infrastructure. Now we're talking about four laning, for instance, the Pacific Highway, um, a road that carries volumes of traffic through a difficult and mountainous terrain way above what that road was designed to carry. We're talking about the Bruce Highway, which links all the cities of coastal Queensland uh, with the capital. Uh, we're talking about the roads um, between Perth and Darwin, which uh, support a lot of the resource sector. So all of these projects have been identified because of their potential to, uh, to give an economic return. They pass a cost-benefit analysis. And uh, therefore, that is an investment which uh, will return to the whole of the country. And on that basis, they are a sound commitment from a government, even when we will have difficult economic circumstances to live with, even when we face deficits. Um, if we are going to grow our economy, then we have to have the infrastructure of the 21st century to be able to support it. Now, questions Please. straight in front. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning, Minister, and uh, thank you for your presentation. Peter Korish uh, from Gundawindi. Uh, Minister, um, you, uh, you mentioned uh, the concept of an infrastructure plan, uh, which I think is a, is a great initiative and, and should be commended. Um, could you expand just a little more on that plan and particularly how we may be able to see perhaps a greater percentage of our approximate $1.6 trillion uh, dollars of, of money that's that's invested in, in superannuation in this country. Is is there uh, a way practically that a greater portion of that could be encouraged into rural and regional infrastructure in particular? Well, thanks, Peter, for the question. It obviously is a very big one. Uh, our plan for uh, to reform Infrastructure Australia will put it ahead of the game by asking them to prepare a 15-year plan that will help to guide industry, the construction sector and indeed the general community on what we are going to be able to achieve over a longer time frame. In the, uh, infrastructure Australia has been playing catch up up until now. Governments tend to announce the program and then it gets referred to Infrastructure Australia in the hope that it might pass the test. And if it doesn't pass the test, the government bills it anyhow uh, because we've made election commitments to do it and we're not going to dishonour our election commitments. And so the, the, the fact is that Infrastructure Australia has not been uh, a leading body in guiding the infrastructure plans of the future. It's been a commentator on the decisions that have already been made. So that's why we are, we are planning the reforms that we are to Infrastructure Australia. It'll have a, an independent board with a CEO answerable to the board uh, rather than a coordinator that answers to the minister, which is the current structure. So it will be able to, to, to look forward and help prepare the, 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 a priority list 
of infrastructure projects into the future. And of course, uh, we'll expect them to engage with the community and, and state and local governments in making sure that that list also uh, delivers on community expectations. Your question about tapping the available funding resources through superannuation funds yeah, is, is also, I guess, something of a holy grail of the infrastructure industry. Uh, we haven't been very successful in encouraging superannuation funds to invest in infrastructure projects in Australia, particularly new greenfield infrastructure projects. Ironically, uh, quite a number of these funds are investing in projects in Europe and Canada in particular, and even South America, but they won't invest in Australia. On the other hand, the, the Canadian Teachers Union is uh, one of the major superannuation funds investing in Australia. So I don't know whether this is just the grass being greener on the other side of the fence, or whether perhaps Australian superannuation fund trustees don't have as much confidence in our country as others do, and as they should. Uh, the, the, there is no shortage of money in Australia and there's no difficulty in borrowing money overseas for infrastructure projects. The complication is to find projects that have got a sufficiently strong revenue stream to make them attractive to a superannuation fund, whose primary objective obviously is to look after yours and my savings. Their task is to make sure that we will have the income that we expect from our superannuation funds uh, when we come to retire. So they, they are not allowed under their own rules, nor would it be good judgment for them to throw money at a project which may be visionary, may be great for the country, but is actually not going to return them any kind of a revenue fl flow. So the challenge is to identify projects in Australia that actually can produce a revenue flow that attracts superann superannuation investments. When you have a brownfield site that's up for sale, like uh, say the Port of Botany is a good, good recent example, there are any number of people willing to buy it. And uh, the end result was a price above market expectations. People were prepared to invest there because this, this port had a history. People knew what it was capable of earning and therefore were willing there to bid quite high. When it comes to some of the tunnel projects and road projects, there have been some fingers burnt. And often it's been because of the fact that patronage was wildly overestimated. So uh, super funds, cautious super funds, are more likely to be willing to invest in a brownfield site than they are to invest in something completely new. And that's why some of the innovative things that particularly New South Wales has been doing lately uh, to link in brownfield projects with new greenfield projects, uh, to provide packages, innovative packages that, that uh, can be parceled up to investors uh, and, and which have a, a strong likelihood of, of delivering good returns. That kind of process seems to be bearing fruit. And I think there'll be, we'll be wanting to do more about that in the future. And the final thing I'd like to say is to re revert to a couple of remarks that I made in my speech about the Toowoomba Range Second Crossing. This will be about the first attempt there's been for a major private-public partnership on a regional road. And unfortunately, we know that there will not be a capacity for that project to return uh, the kind of revenue that would enable it to be entirely funded by the private sector. Indeed, I suspect in the end, governments will be the major funding partners. Now, we felt it was worth testing the market. We want the private sector to have skin in the game, and that's why it's being, the tenders are being designed around a, a finance, build and operate model. So we hope the private sector will contribute as much as possible, and that they will run it and be able to meet the running costs uh, from the toll revenue, but we know that governments are going to have to contribute something towards it. So when you get into regional communities, even a project like that one, which has such enormous social and economic benefits, uh, it, will be, it is very difficult to find projects, other than perhaps ports, uh, which are likely to be able to deliver an adequate return to attract a superannuation fund. Uh, a gentleman up the back. 
Minister Truss, it's pleasing to hear of your government's support for road and rail, but another important part of infrastructure that we didn't hear from you this morning is about communications. <coughs> Rural and regional Australia is already at a significant disadvantage to our city cousins. And as agriculture gets more technologically dependent, the need for telecommunications, a quality and reliable and fast and reasonable download service is more and more important. Is the government committed to providing us in regional Australia a, a service comparable to the city cousins? And um, the previous NBN plan, like I had the cable going through my property, but the th only thing I was going to get out of it was a new roost for my carrier pigeons. So um, is the government aware of that need in rural and regional Australia? Well, ab absolutely, and we are committed to delivering high-speed broadband to, to all Australians just as quickly as we possibly can. Now, the previous government had a number of failings, but there was probably nothing more monumental than the NBN. It is, it is, it is a, an economic and, and, and management disaster. And in spite of the fact that billions have already been spent, uh, very few have actually been connected. And once more, it's going to take a lot of effort to untangle the mess and to make it actually work. If you want to look uh, at regional, at the most remote parts of regional Australia, under the NBN plan and indeed uh, under our own vision, those areas are largely going to be served by satellite. And so the government announced a, uh, two or three years ago that they were going to provide services for 250,000 Australians by way of, the, the, of existing uh, satellites. But unfortunately, they only bought enough spaces for 48,000 customers. And those 48,000 customers, the last of them were connected in December last year. So in spite of the promise that 250,000 would be served, only 48,000 have been connected and there are no more places available. And we are hunting around to try and find where we might be able to get more places and we're not confident that we can. Now in 2015, two new NBN satellites, billion dollar each, uh, will be launched. And that should provide uh, a quantum leap in the quality and quantity of satellite uh, connections available. And that will be the long-term solution for many people who live in regional Australia. Unfortunately, of the 48,000 that are connected to the existing satellites, it was working quite well uh, early in the piece, but there were no limits put on the amount of space that these people could use. And so a handful of people are using up most of the capacity. And others now, it's slowed so, so much down that it's, uh, that it's of no practical value to them. Now, on top of that, uh, kids can't get connected to the school of the air and all that sort of thing. It is, it is just dreadful. Uh, people in less remote areas uh, and, uh, are likely to be serviced by, by wireless. And this is one area where the NBN has been making some progress and there are a number of NBN uh, uh, towers currently under construction. In fact, I, last Saturday I went to my school reunion in the little town of Cumbia, uh, which was 100 years, my primary school was 100 years old on, on Saturday. And I was absolutely staggered when I drove into this town of my hometown of, uh, where, I, where I grew up of a couple of hundred people and there's this gigantic silver tower in the town which, is an, which will be an NBN wireless transmitter. That's fantastic for a little place like that. It's not connected yet but, uh, but it, it surely will be soon. And you're seeing those things bobbing up in really small regional communities around the countryside. Uh, so th I think, uh, and we'll be maintaining the pace on that and the areas that will be served by wireless, I think will make reasonable progress. Now, I guess the trouble is the, the, the NBN rollout, the fibre optic cable and the connections to households, which are sort of way behind every single schedule the NBN has laid down. Workmanship is a problem. Um, there's still issues with connecting to large buildings and sites of that nature. It's not ever going to be possible with current technology as I understand it to sort of hook up everybody who just happens to have a cable going through their place. There are, there are, there are thousands of stories of cables going past people's door and yet they can't connect to the NBN and, 
uh, and that, that's not likely to be solvable in the short to the medium term. But we are committed uh, to, a, to a broadband rollout across the country. We want the highest possible, uh, uh, we, the highest possible speeds uh, that, that can be made available to be made available. Uh, just one or two final points. Um, Telstra, Telstra have now successfully tested uh, the use of copper cables to deliver speeds up to 100 megabits per second, uh, which is the NBN uh, target for to connections to the household. And, uh, and uh, Samsung, I understand, are now testing 5G telephone, mobile phones, which are also capable of 100 megabits per second. So the world is moving on and will continue to move on and we have, we'll have technology in 10 years that we couldn't even dream of today. Uh, Minister, thank you very much. I'm going to draw this session to a close because uh, we are out of time, but could you please thank the Honourable Warren Trust, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. <laughs>